Uh, first of all, let me start off by saying please thank the folks in the orange shirts uh, that are the volunteer. That's not someone the scale orange shirt, is it? No. Uh, please thank the volunteers who put the show on. This is the best show in the open source world. Um, the folks who do here sweat blood and tears year round to make this weekend the best weekend it can be. And the price that they charge is absolutely amazing. So if you see Ilan and the crew, please profusely thank them. My name is Dave Stokes. I'm a community manager for MySQL products, uh, which means Oracle pays me to go around the world proselytizing on MySQL software. I'm also your conduit back to Oracle management. Uh, if you ever have a question, complaint, gripe, or just a what the heck is Oracle doing, uh, give it to me. I will take it to my bosses. Um, if it's something we can act on publicly, we can. If not, believe me, they sweat over every piece of input that we get. So today we're talking about MySQL, no SQL. Um, take it that most of you have bosses, and your bosses read things like Datamation or InfoWorld or all that, and your bosses are going, we need to do big data. I don't have a good reason to do big data, but that's the big trend, so we've got to have big data. Uh, what happens in a lot of companies is they end up having uh, what they hope is a, a farm of data and they end up getting a di digital landfill. So if you're in the uh, world where your boss is demanding you have big data, or you actually have reasons to start peaking the big data world or the NoSQL world but really don't have any idea how to really get going, and you don't want to go out and buy 10,000 boxes to set up a Hadoop farm, this is an approach. Uh, SQL has been around for decades now. Uh, a lot of the data that you deal with on a regular basis is relational. Uh, you have an ID number that ties to a business, and they're expecting payments that have tied to that so they know who's been paying. Uh, the accountants at your company come through and say, I want the information for January and February. Um, big problem that a lot of developers have is that SQL is a declarative language. It's made up of two parts, uh, data manipulation and data description language. Works, it's great, but it doesn't sync up directly with procedural or object relational languages. Uh, causes some problems here and there. There are some workarounds for that. The other big problem with SQL is it's not well taught. I mainly focus in the PHP world, and I go to lots of PHP conferences, and I talk to lots of PHP developers, and roughly one and a half to two percent of them have ever had any SQL training. That's the most popular web development course or worst web development language in this planet, and very few of them actually know what they're doing when they're playing with SQL. No SQL is kind of an amorphous term. Um, it's not truly relational. Often it's schemaless. A lot of developers say, I don't really care what the data is. I want to capture it, and I'll let someone else go through it later. Uh, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. Those of you with gray hair who grew up on Berkeley Unix probably remember the old Berkeley database. I see one gentleman smirking over here. Uh, Berkeley DB was a great thing in its time. Uh, a lot of the NoSQL options really don't scale well. As Peter Zaitsev from Percona says, his teenage son can put everything in the center of his room and not put it away, and that's his NoSQL store, but it's not going to scale as he gets older. So what happens is a lot of companies end up with separate relational pools and non-relational pools. And I don't know about you all, but how many of you really have extra, extra time to be able to go back between two pools of data and don't really worry about having to keep two sets of systems running at the same time. Um, it gets really messy. And there's lots of tools. I don't know if any of you have peeked in the Hadoop world, but if you go into the Hadoop sphere, uh, they have 85 zillion tools. And none of them quite work out of the box with each other. Uh, Apache has the big top project where they take all the pop more popular tools, put them together, and, and guarantee that they work. Uh, one step outside of that big top project, and you are in a world of hurt. But what if you could get by with using one set of servers, one set of disks, and access the data as SQL when you need, or access, access it as a key value pair when you need? And it's the same data. 
and you have people doing that at the same time. Um, what if you had a way to easily convert uh, relational schemas into NoSQL? What if you could drink from a fire hose by NoSQL and then be able to run analytics on it later with SQL? Uh, what if you still need to keep the acid uh, part of it so you can do transactions? And you kind of keep your e ecosystem small. Well, a couple years ago, uh, Yoshinori Matsunobu was working at a company called Dina, and he came up with something called Handler Socket. Uh, Handler Socket basically bypassed the optimizer and the parser in the, in the stack, I'll show you a picture of that later, to go right to the NODB data store. And he was getting right around three quarters of a million queries per second on fairly generic hardware. Great. Um, uh, Handler Socket's still out there. And uh, he used memcache as a front end uh, for the front end cache, but not for storing rows. And he's got a wonderful blog post. Uh, by the way, my presentations I tend to do differently than a lot of folks. I put in a lot of information. Please download the slides later. Don't try to copy down everything. Just try to get the general gist. Well, our engineers took a look at that and said, well, let's get a little bit more on the memcached D protocol standard. Uh, let's set up drivers so you can use a little more uh, bigger pool of languages to do it. Uh, what if we put some security on there and just not let everything run right open? And by doing that, they were able to get it up to 1.1 uh, million queries per second. Uh, Yoshinori himself, uh, using our NODB memcache plugin, gets a little bit better than that. So we kind of get uh, a good cross pollinization um, You get direct, direct access to the storage engine. I uh, don't have to go through the parser and the optimizer. Uh, to give you an idea of the overhead, that means it's nine times faster than standard SQL access. Uh, if you're running memcached in the same process space, uh, you get, get rid of a lot of network contention, and they're both play fairly well with each other. Uh, if you keep requesting the same data and data over and over again, it's stored in the NOD buf NODB buffer pool. Uh, the buffer pool handles a lot of the caching. Uh, the data can be structured or unstructured. Uh, the demo I'll do a little bit later, we're just putting in one variable, but you can put in uh, a delimiter that you want, like a pipe or a semicolon or a tab, and string multiple things together to have it go into an NODB table. Sure. Uh, basically, you say, okay, this is the table I want to take it into, and these are the columns I want to intersperse it into. I've seen it usually on the one-to-one -one relationship, and I'm trying to think why it wouldn't do one-to-many. And I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to go out and play with it. Uh, let me give you a card, and I'll go out and play with it and, okay. and get back to you. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, uh, well, well, basically, you get all this NoSQL stuff fed in through this uh, stuff and then feed it out to multiple tables underneath there. It would involve some sort of a joint. Uh, a lot of the transfer between memory and disk is handled automatically. You don't have to worry about it at the application layer. Um, if you're really a heavy memcached layer, suddenly you have persistence. You can store all the session variables you want. Um, now, the way that NODB normally works for primary key lookup is a very good match for the way memcached does things. So if you're used to running memcached, this is a... a uh, easy addition to what you're doing. Now, because you're doing all this stuff with a uh, key value pair, someone underneath can come through and run analytics by using SQL and using the normal functions like max and average and all that stuff. Now, the architecture, on the left you have what everyone's used to. Uh, the application uh, has the MySQL server and 
and does the handler API and then goes to storage engine. With the memcached protocol, uh, we have a plug-in and it goes through uh, the various tables that it has and goes to the storage engine. Uh, we bundle this all together. Uh, the setup is very straightforward. Uh, the first thing you do is you run a script to set up some tables. Uh, the second thing you do is you load the plugin. That's a one-time install. Uh, once you get it running, you can talk to the server using just about any language out there. Uh, basically, you have to specify the server name and the port. Uh, usually, it's 11211. You can change that. You can use the text and the binary protocol. Uh, prerequisites. Uh, right now, the plugin only works on uh, anything that's not Windows. Uh, you have to have libevent installed. Uh, to set up, the first thing you do is you run a script. Um, as you can see, uh, you source it from your uh, share directory under your MySQL installation. And this script goes out there and creates a couple tables. We'll take a look at those in a minute. Do it once, and you're done. Uh, the three tables are cache policies, config options, and containers. Also, in the test directory, you'll have a demo underscore test, which you'll see how to use that. Uh, there's also a copy of that uh, in the NODB memcache uh, schema, but it's kind of there just for documentation. So if you look at the container file, uh, the important part is that you have the columns that are used for the key value lookup. In this case, it's marked C1. And then where you're going to store the data. So you have your key and then your value. Uh, the other two tables, uh, cache policy. Uh, basically, you can change the cache policy to be have NODB do the caching, uh, have it done in, in memory, which is basically a memcached D, or both. And you can split that up so that you can have some things that memcache D times out and M NODB stores for you. Uh, the table on the right, you see the, the name separator and the pipe symbol. If we were loading in multiple columns, uh, the way we're doing, doing it, and you'll see in a minute, uh, we'd separate the various fields with a pipe. You can change that up to whatever you want it to be. OK, after you run that script, you load the plugin. Uh, once again, you're in MySQL. Uh, install plugin daemon underscore memcached shared object name, and then put in the name. Uh, once it's installed, it's good to go for subsequent reboots. If you want to get rid of it, you can see how to do that on the bottom there. Have I blown anyone into the weeds yet? OK. Now, if you want to test it, we can do a test in a minute. Um, what you do is you tell that to the memcached port, which is 11211. I should over here, too. And here we're going to set uh, something we're going to call A11. And we're going to set a flag of 10. Not quite sure what that is. Uh, time to lo live, 0, because don't want it to expire right now. And then the size of what we're throwing in there. And in this case, we're throwing in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine characters. So that's why we have the nine up there. Nine for nine. Uh, once you hit return, you'll get a store message. And then you can come back and type get A1, A11, which is what we call the, the key there. And it gives it back all that information. Simple. Now from the SQL side. If I go out and I do the select from test.demo.test, guess what information I'll see? Oops, I don't have a slide for that. OK, I'll show that in a minute. Now, there's some things you can do to tune this. Um, you can set a batch size. If you want everything that hits memcached to go right to NODB, set it to 1. If you really are doing a lot and you only want them doing batches of 100, set it that to 100. Uh, you can also turn off row locks if you're doing a lot of just simple lookups of, of data you don't really need um, great control on and you're looking for more speed, turn that off. Uh, once again, you can set the cache policy to have memcache store it, NODB store it, or both. And you can set that independently for set, increment, get, decrement, delete, and flush. Uh, 
Uh, something you might want to do is set your SQL mode to read uncommitted um, if things are flushing slowly. Now, if you want to send it out to replication slaves, um, basically the slaves will catch whatever hits the master. And if you really, really, really want to read the details, there's about six pages to read in section 14.18 of the MySQL manual. So what's coming in the future? Well, this has been fairly popular for a lot of our bigger customers that are doing uh, high-speed web interface. And our engineers have been trying to make it a lot better for 5.7. 5.7 right now is what we call a developer milestone release. This is where you, we ask you to go out, download it, break it, tell us where things uh, don't work the way you want. Uh, 5.6 is our current release. It's been out for about two years. Now, this is good, but it's not quite what you wanted. Uh, also in 5.7, we're going to have a HTTP plugin. This means you're going to have something that runs on a phone, it's the database directly without going through some sort of application on a server. Uh, you can do this for JSON documents, uh, do CRUD, and you can do straight SQL. Also, as of last month, there are some JSON UDFs that you could use. They're written by one of our uh, engineers. Her name is Feta. Uh, if you look up uh, MySQL JSON UDFs with S-V-E-T-A, you'll find a couple blog posts on that. So before I do a quick demo, uh, let me give you the, the general information on how to get a hold of me. Once again, the slides are at slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Stoker. Uh, a year ago, there was a Nicole Kidman movie called Stoker. So if you dig back through my tweets and you see something about red hair and nudity, it's not me <laughs> this time. <laughs> this time. And uh, that's my blog. So. Uh, I can do that. I haven't done that yet. Um, the other slide, the slides were posted up on uh, SlideShare last night. So, yeah, I do. And move the window higher. Okay. <laughs> Well, actually, right now I'm using Ubuntu on top of uh, Vagrant. Oh, down in here is putting a D on there. Okay, let's see what I can do about font. And I don't think... I haven't used putty in years, so if anyone has any clues. Is that a little more legible? Okay. So, of course that rolls off the end. This is a config options table. If I uh, live demos fun. So let me get out of that. So telnet to 127.0.0.1.11211. Yeah.
Okay, so I can go back and get the stuff that we had from. Oh, does I have it in there? Okay, so set. Uh, sir, what's your name? Jason. Okay, set Jason. And five. Capitalize your name. Ta da. Um, may not look like much, but. Um, it's a great way to get the information out. I guess the time to look wasn't there. Okay. Okay. have Jason and Jason. Ta-da! Um, that is, in a nutshell, what our NoSQL option looks like. As you can see, it's highly complicated, hard to understand, and difficult to demo. <laughs> so. Uh, five, six. Ooh, I, I need to throw out some dolphins, don't I? I'll first one the Jason for letting us borrow his name. Oops. Um, so like you have multiple tables that you're, you asked a question earlier too. Yes, sir. <laughs> question. I'll get to the pipe to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could, like you said, use searching searching the stream of data. You could probably use a full set search set search, or you use an application to go through, pull that out of the database, and then parse it down later. Um, <laughs> the, the bouncer over there somewhere. Um, once you get into the database, um, the trick is there's many different ways to do it. Um, you could use some sort of regular expression search on there. You could use a full text search. It, yeah, there's there's no really clear win right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the companies down the street from me has a very extensive set of Pentaho tools that they're using that they feed the data in through this and use Pentaho as an ETL tool to go out and do something else. So there are ways to do it. Uh, pipe question. Uh, if you're feeding multiple columns in and you want to use that as a separator, it's like first name, last name, uh, email address, you'd put the pipe character in there and this plug-in through Memcached would know how to separate those, off, separate those off into various fields. Yes, ma'am. Yes, there are. Uh, they're fairly simple, but they're well detailed in the manual. If you go to section 14 and look up for the NODB, you know, IPI access, they show you how to take an existing, existing NODB-based application and move it into the NoSQL. They also have a thing, if you have something that's running memcached D, to move that into the, the realm of, of NODB. Um, if I can follow the instructions, just about anyone else can. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, let's go. To It's a standard uh, Python call to SQL or memcached. D. There's no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there a way to um, instead of having to duplicate your data into a new set of tables, just use NoSQL to, to access the existing tables? Yes. 
In Section 1418 of the manual, they talk about taking an existing application and uh, how to adapt that to use the NoSQL. It, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Yes, sir. Yeah. Because you, when you use memcached, you bypass the optimizer and the parser. So, yes, sir. Um, yes. Uh, I think Maria also has, well, Maria has handler socket. I don't know if they have this API. Uh, Colin, do you have it in 10.1 or? In 10.1, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything has to be replicated. Oops. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Um, Redis, I honestly don't know what the engineers are talking about. Uh, Memcached is a little more popular than Redis for most of the folks we talk to. If you really, really, really want it, give me your business card and I'll talk to our engineers about it. Um, I've used Redis in the, in the past and really like it. Uh, it's just that we saw Memcached is a little more obvious of a straightforward win for us. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are quiet. Don't any of you want a dolphin? Yeah. That was a time to live for that piece of cache data. It's setting it to zero means it's going to be there infinitely. It's a it's part of the it's part of the memcached protocol. Yeah. Memcached, yes. If you haven't played with it before, it's kind of different than a relational database. It's automatically different CPS. Yeah. So if you want it to live for five seconds, you can put that in there. If you want it to never expire, you can do that. Uh, you can set it up with memcache. Um, with some of our options, you can set it up. Um, Uh, the first one is a set of flags. There's a whole bunch of memcached flags. Uh, if you go to the documentation, they're all explicitly detailed. Um, yeah. So our key was lowercase JSON, and our value was uppercase J JSON. So. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, um, if you have general questions about where Oracle is going with MySQL, what MySQL 5.7 is going to look like. Um, if you want to see Workbench, um, let me know. I'm at the booth downstairs. Um, I have more swag. I have mints. Um, anyone want here admit, admit that they really want a mint? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Here, uh, these don't fly very well. One's for the guy back there, too. Um, other than that, thank you all for coming out. Be sure to thank the folks who work this show. Uh, they do an amazing job, and they really, really do deserve to have their butts kissed. I don't say that all about a lot of folks, but these folks do an amazing job for your, your benefit. And thank you for coming out. <laughs>